Good morning, Kelowna and Victoria. And a little smoky here again today, as we see in the mountains there. Not too bad, but it's uh, it's still there. Very it's a little heavy. better, a little better than it was. But, uh, yeah, some areas are definitely a little bit on the smoky side. Yeah. Well, that'll all clear away, I'm sure, as time goes on yeah, here. Um, Ken, it is a it is a beautiful day here, though, in the Okanagan. I just mm-hmm. get up in the morning at this time of year and just walk outside in the mm-hmm. garden and just oh, enjoy it. Yeah. Uh, because... I, <laughs> are we gonna are we gonna say it this is our favorite time of year <laughs> it's not quite fall yet though <laughs> this is still summer well it's still summer but it feels fallish when you uh when you start to get it, getting up in the morning and breathing the air it's kind of nice yeah, okay it is yeah it cools off it's <laughs> lovely yeah let's do the tips and plants of the week you betcha. Well, my tip of the week is uh Don't give up on your annuals. The fall coolness will bring them on. And we're speaking specifically in the the Okanagan. It's been so darn hot here that that, uh, the annuals suffer. And then, but as the weather cools down, they get a whole new uh, lease on life. Yeah. Uh, Not knowing, of course, because they don't think too much, not knowing that another month and a half and they're frozen. But anyway, we won't won't, won't tell, we won't tell the annuals that. No. We'll let them, we'll let them thrive. Uh, my uh, plant of the week is my hibiscus, uh, Moschutus, the summer storm. It, it's just really looking good right now. Yeah. yeah. They are a beautiful, beautiful plant, that's for sure. A huge dinner plate blooms on those things. All right, I also have a tip and a plant this week, and my tip of the week is that this is the time of year that if you have any empty garden space and you've taken out plants and you've just got bare soil, you don't want to leave it bare. You want to make sure that you're adding something to that and keeping some sort of plant living there. So that's called a cover crop. So cover crops are available. You can go to garden centers. They'll sell different types of uh, seed packages, and many of them will say right on it, cover crop. And then you just sprinkle that over that area, follow the label directions, and then you'll get some type of plant that will grow up in that area that will help to feed the soil. The one that I really like is the crimson clover because it does fix nitrogen into the soil, and it's kind of a nice one. I seeded mine last weekend, and um, they're already up and growing already, and it's only been one week. So there you go, and uh, it's it's just, I think, a great thing to do. All right, now my plant of the week this week is the Heptacodium myconioides, which is the seven suns tree. And it's just a plant that's in bloom at this time of year. It's it's going to be just pounding out beautiful pink flowers all the way through until into October. And it's just one of those interesting small trees. It only gets about 10 or 12 feet high uh, in that range, maybe a little higher, and uh, blooms in September. It's just an interesting time for a tree to flower. So there you go. That's my tips and plants for this week. Remember to check growercoach.com and growercoach on YouTube. You betcha, Ken. Uh, that is cool. You know, getting <coughs> most things, most trees and uh, bloom in the spring. In the spring, most yeah. Of them, most of them. But mm-hmm. there are a few that bloom in the summer and in the fall. Yeah, um, day length today is 13 hours and 25 minutes and three seconds long. Ah, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. It's, they're shortening up. It's, uh, you know, we're, we're um, two hours and 56 minutes shorter than, the, than that long day in June that we had, 21st mm-hmm. of June. Uh, so almost three hours. We, we've lost almost three hours of, of daylight. And so, of course, this is triggering a lot of the plants, the chrysanthemums and things that bloom in the fall. This is pretty. And mm. uh, interesting, though, this um, Montauk daisy that I have, that yeah. white daisy, really healthy plants, and I don't see a bloom, not a bud coming on them. So they better hurry up yeah, uh, and, and get going here because they do bloom in the fall. Mm. And uh it's like a, it looks like a Shasta, but it's uh, not. It's is it affected not. by uh, outdoor light? Do you think because it is? It's a short, short day yeah. plant, so it needs it, to have the short days in order to trigger the bloom. Like a chrysanth- like some chrysanthemums, right. a lot of chrysanthemums don't really do that much anymore. They just bloom, but uh, they, uh, but these um, these plants are are a relative. I think of Shastas are more like uh, the uh, you know Leucanthemum relative. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems to be like almost like halfway between the leucanthemum and chrysanthemum. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just a cool plant, but they are affected by day length. That's one of the things that triggers yeah. them. Do you have an outside light well, or something uh, that's the front, I, I'm, I'm thinking about this because the front one, the one that I have two of them. <clears throat> I have one in the front yard in right by the road, by the street. And there is a street lamp there, street light. So that could be an issue. 
The right. one in the backyard, it's hard to say. I don't know if there's that much light uh, showing mm-hmm. back there. Yeah. But anyway, we'll see. It, uh, it won't be the end of the world if, if uh, they're blooming and it starts to freeze. They're, <laughs> they're pretty tough. Yeah. They, pretty they tough. Usually yeah. they'll trigger, if, if not, uh, you know, well, day length, number one, but cooling off at night certainly helps. Got some uh, messages from the uh, folks at the Abkhazi Gardens in uh, Victoria. Mm -hmm. And we've got uh, Ron is going to, Ron Eastwood is going to be calling in at some point today to talk about the events coming up. There's one coming up this next week. So uh, we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. And I want to wish everybody a happy Labor Day. Yeah. Um, It's a nice long weekend. It is. It makes a a nice long weekend. And uh, my son Joe and his his, uh, partner, uh, Sabrina are in town, mm-hmm. and we're enjoying their visit. Uh, stayed up a little late last night, but it's okay. That's the <laughs> way it goes. It. Oh, I tell mm. you. Well, Donna and I are having fun uh, recently. We've, we've been watching Downton Abbey. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I'd never known about Downton Abbey till about, oh, about two months ago, and Donna said, you should, you should watch this with me. And I said, oh, okay. And I started watching once you get to know the people, you know, the butler, the Carson, the butler, and, mm-hmm. and the various the personalities and whatnot, <clears throat> it's kind of addicting. <laughs> yeah, I know a lot of people who watch. I don't actually watch, but I probably will at some point. <laughs> it's something else. I've been calling Donna my lady lately, and she's been calling me my lord. <laughs> We're the lord and lady Burnett. <laughs> we don't have any servants, mind you. We pretend we do. Yeah. <laughs> but, but we don't have these people waiting on us. Uh, you wait on each other. It's yeah, fabulous. that's right. Yeah. Fascinating to see uh, back in the day in the aristocracy of England how they they um, um, they uh, uh, would have somebody who actually dresses you in the morning, which is quite yeah. interesting. Wow. Hey, if yeah. you guys don't, oh, sorry, if you guys don't mind for one sec, uh, the phone lines just having a little bit of an issue. We have some people calling in. I just want to let them know I can't answer the phone right now. I'm going to uh, go reset it once we hit a break. Okay. okay. Yeah. Perfect. The phone yeah. is, we have an issue with the phones, folks, and uh, we we uh, we will uh, get back on board here. So if you're trying to phone in, yeah. hang on. We will get to you. Um, yeah, it should and, be good after the yeah. next break. So yep. You betcha. Perfect. And when you do, it's 250-862-2525 or one 888 Four two seven three, but we will get that sorted out very quickly here. Mm-hmm. Um, fairy ring mushrooms, yep, they're happening. Mm-hmm. And Marasmius oreades. I brought my mushroom book with me. Oh yes, yeah. Foraging for wild mushrooms, edible wild mushrooms, and they yeah. talk about. There's some that you know are so easy to identify, and there's absolutely. But I, I don't like to talk about mushrooms on the radio just willy-nilly and just say, oh, go out and pick some mushrooms and eat them. Yeah. Because you can run into some pretty, pretty, you know, toxic ones. Yeah. However, yeah. if you do your homework, uh, there are some like the, you can't miss with Marasmius oreades. You mm-hmm. can't miss with the shaggy mane. Yeah. Our morels know. are pretty good. You know, the, because uh, I have identified the false morel, yep. but I don't really find it looks at all like a morel, really. That's right. It like does. it's sort of similar-ish, but not really at all. So, you know, there's certain mushrooms that you can identify. Uh, even the puffballs, you know, mm-hmm. the puffballs are great mushroom. Yeah. If you catch them, you'll see them when they're just like a little button mm-hmm. and just starting out. And then by the next day, they're the size of a loony. Yeah. And that's perfect. You harvest them right away. And they're beautiful and white all the way through. And you can fry them. And they're just lovely. Saute. Oh, yeah. really good. Very tasty. And, but you can tell right away if you cut them in half and there's any kind of sign of a slight green discoloration mm-hmm. or anything, then you know they've gone too far. For yeah, sure. right. Yeah. So anybody out there that has had mushroom experience, uh, talking of edible mushrooms, um, yeah, you might want to share your experience with us. We've, we've uh, had some fun with them over the years, and, and uh, Ken and I have talked about mushrooms for many, many years now. And, mm. uh, yeah, my dear friend, Brian Todd, who passed away a, over a year, a little over a year ago. Sadly, um, my music teacher, and subsequently we were in bands together over the years and played played music and mm-hmm. dances and stuff. Anyway, Brian was a, a shroomer. He was a he was yeah. a he was what they call a um, uh, mycologist. M- no, mycophile. Mycophile. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. 
he was he was crazy. And I would I would go to, to, to him with, with a sample. I would find some mushrooms. I found some on the golf course one time, and I didn't know what they were, but I thought, well, I'll go find out from Brian. So mm-hmm. he said, oh, these are such and such, and they're great. So we chopped them up and sautéed them and had a nice little meal uh, mm-hmm. with, with some uh, that, al- along with other things, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, and he... <laughs> <laughs> I don't recommend this. This is a story I'm going to tell you, but I don't recommend it. Um, what Brian said, well, you know, if I don't know what it is, I think I know what it is. I'm not <laughs> sure. I will take just a sli- a tiny little bit and, and try it and wait. <laughs> don't be doing don't that, do folks. That. This is not something I'm no. recommending to do. But my dear friend Brian Todd used to do that. And I laughed when he told me that. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, well, there's I, I so wonder many, why he was so crazy. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's so many different uh, species. You know, the chanterelles are just lovely, lovely mushrooms. Mm-hmm. And, and um, there's just a lot of a lot of really great uh, mushrooms out there. And they're very, very tasty. So it's, it's fun. It's a hobby. It's something you learn. And if, if uh, you know, if you do have a local club uh, where they go out and... Uh, show you different mushrooms is fun to do yeah get involved and learn some the mushroom club stuff. there's a club yeah. for everything ken yeah uh okay we're going to take a short break and Jaden's going to go and fix those phones uh yeah. he's going to put he's going to climb up the pole outside and uh <laughs> tie the wire together again yep. okay put her back together <laughs> we'll be back with the garden show after this short break Announcement, announcement, the phones are now up. You can now phone in to the garden show. There you go. I just <laughs> thought I'd put that public announcement out. Yeah, there you go. Uh, yeah. Um, so I've sown the 900 Walla Walla seeds from uh, Stokes, and they're up. Not fully. Uh, the, you know, the germination wasn't perfect on them. No. But they do have um, 2022, uh, 2022's... Uh, date on oh, oh, yeah. their, their last year's onion seeds. Oh, okay. If you're going to buy, I'm just trying to think how, yeah. how to do this because onion seeds don't hold up. Um, we know that from our experience at the nursery, mm-hmm. uh, at the greenhouse operation. Uh, onion seeds just don't hold up. Like They got to be you know. fresh. Yeah. It's, um, anyway. So and it's hard to get fresh onion seeds mm-hmm. right in the middle of summer, well, that's which right. is when we need, we want to seed them. I okay. want to seed them on uh, August 1st. So I had, I bought the three different varieties. Mm-hmm. I got Kelsey's mm-hmm. and I got uh, the Elsa Craig's mm-hmm. and then also the Walla Walla's. And I put in, I seeded them all and I would get like out of a whole package of seeds, which has maybe like a hundred or so seeds in each one. I only got maybe about mm-hmm. eight or 10 germinated, you know, Ooh. that's it. And then out of another uh, package, that, that was the, um, the Elsa Craig's, the uh, Walla Wallas, or I mean the 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 Kelsey's, there was about maybe twenty, mm. you know, out of one hundred and twenty seeds, yeah. and then the Walla Wallas, I seeded two full packages, so about three hundred seeds, and I ended up with about maybe thirty to fifty plants somewhere mm. in that range. Yeah. So good. very poor germination, and so exactly what you just said is you got to have fresh seed. And uh, what I would maybe suggest is that you buy it in the spring when it's fresh and put mm-hmm. it in your refrigerator right. where it's kept cold rather than just having it, you know, at room temperature. Because that's yeah. got to help. Or freeze it, really, I guess. Yeah, yeah. freezing yeah. would work. We used to keep a lot of seeds in the freezer. Mm-hmm. Uh, we want to say good morning to Ariel, who has not been listening to the Garden Show this morning because <laughs> she was phoning in and didn't realize that we knew all about it. So good morning, Ariel. <laughs> Well, that's what happened. I I called you six times, and I had the the speaker on my radio turned off. So there you go. Uh, well, well. <laughs> you must really, really need to, to to ask a question this morning. I I do, I do, I do. But first of all, let me tell you a most exciting thing. Mm-hmm. There was a um, popcorn orb spider that that decided to make her web outside of the front of our building, and it was amazing. I got pictures of her and everything. Oh, nice. so, was it yeah. her? It is uh, her. well. <laughs> I'm calling her. How do you know? Because, you know you, they're always, ah, who knows? Did you check it um, out? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, okay. I love this time of the year when it gets cooler and the plants just go, ah. Mm. Oh, yeah, it's a beautiful yeah. time of year. Mm. Yeah, it really is. Uh, the, the big beef tomatoes, listen, to, I'm just wondering if you guys have experienced the fact that they stalled 
during that weird weather we were having, you know, mm. that, that they didn't sort of ripen up as much. Mm. And now they're starting to ripen up. And can I count on them, the big ones, you know, getting red and riper and riper? Oh, yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. As fall comes on, though, the, the uh, ripening aspect is going to, to lessen because of the cool evenings, cool nights. They're a tropical. They, they, you know, in the Okanagan, uh, for instance, uh, you know, last night it, it got well, like this morning, it's only nine degrees. Uh, so it probably mm-hmm. got down to about seven, six or seven last night here in the Okanagan. Yeah. And that's a little uh-huh. cool. That's a little cool for tomatoes. But um, yeah, but my big deal with my tomatoes, and we were showing you, Ken, the other day, how uh, it, they, they, were, they had such a core to them, like that yeah. hard white core in there. Yeah. And uh, you were saying that it is the mainly the, the sun, Heat. the hot hot sun and mm. causing that. I'm just wondering uh, if anyone in the Victoria listening audience uh, had any issues with tomatoes having that because Without. you may not have quite the intensity of the of the heat, so you might be in better shape. Yeah, well, Ariel, your um, your plants it's a, it's a little unusual in a way. Are you finding that the tops of the plants are staying green and the bottoms turning red, or no? But I am experiencing a lot of splitting. In the you know yeah, in the splitting. tops especially yeah, and and these are all heat you know heat issues. The stalling occurs with like with any plants. Once the temperature outside reaches about a hundred degrees Fahrenheit, it's actually even closer to ninety degrees Fahrenheit. That once it hits those temperatures, uh, the plants stop photosynthesizing, and so a lot of things stop when it gets hot. And we wow. had we had weeks and weeks and weeks of 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 well and months actually of temperatures where we were just cooking and mm-hmm. um, you know some plants they're sort of uh, let's say developed to withstand it but the, their their method of dealing with it is to go dormant for a while and wait for the weather to change and so that's maybe what's happened with yours is that they just kind of stalled I think, I think that's exactly yeah. it and yeah. yeah. I thank you I, I sort of thought that was it but I had to check it out with the experts yeah and, and bring just one more Bring Sorry. some. I was going to say, just bring bring in a few of them and just ripen them in the in the kitchen, you know, just on the counter, and see how they do, and see okay. if there's a difference, you know, between the ones outside and inside. Yep. And the next thing, I just one more question I have about the house, all the house plants I've got outside, the Sansevierias and the jades and the Christmas cactuses. Mm-hmm. We don't bring those in until what middle of September, eight, end of September. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's it's exactly it's it's. It, and even like as Don was saying, it was pretty pretty chilly the last couple of nights. But you know, it's that's okay. It's just a, an occasional thing. I think we'll be warming up at night here as we go along. So it's really watching the night temperatures. And when they're down in that getting close to five degrees, that's when you sort of have to start thinking about it and and knowing the plant. Like some plants, they just cannot handle the cold and they don't like it and they stall too. But sometimes they stall to the point of almost dying right. with tropicals, oh. right? But uh, okay. those uh, the Christmas cactuses, they're pretty good. They'll go right down to almost freezing sometimes. Yeah. So they're pretty, pretty and jade tough. and jade and Sansevieria too, right? Yeah, they're pretty tough. Yeah. Uh, I leave mine yeah. out, uh, Ariel, t- till the last minute before it freezes. But yeah. you know, some <laughs> things, you know, I, I have to pack the greenhouse. We're going to have to move okay. on. We've got some callers waiting, but uh, Ariel, Bye-bye. nice to hear from you. Take care. Yeah. And turn Bye. that speaker on. Yes, I, <laughs> okay. I will. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Okay, girl. Yeah. Okay. Um, we now have um, Vicki uh, calling in. Good morning, Vicki. Good morning. Listen, I have a mandevilla, and it's a beautiful plant, and I'm wondering, can I bring that in and it would be a house plant over the winter? Yes. Yeah, for sure, yeah. And what about the tendrils? Do I just cut them off so that they're yeah, just can, more manageable you, in the yeah, house? Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't hurt to clip it back and uh, make it yeah, manageable. Wrap it around the plant. That's yeah. a, you know, yeah. it just depends on what you want for next year. Vicky, okay. you might you might experience some defoliation to the plant. Um, okay. Because Ken's often talked about this. The, 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 they're so get, so used to being outside where they're getting full light and everything. Then you bring them inside, and those that foliage isn't properly functioning because what is it ken the, the pore well, the pores it's are... a couple different things yeah. but uh there's there's it's just plants that basically develop a system of dealing with bright bright outdoor light and then when you bring them inside they don't have that bright outdoor light anymore so then they uh they literally will often either have to grow new leaves to adapt to the lower light of being indoors 
Um, or over time, they can adapt. Uh, the chemicals within the leaves can change to make them more adapted to lower light. But I would just say when you bring it inside, keep it in a nice bright window. Remember that they don't need quite as much water when they're indoors as when they're outdoors. And if you can bring it inside when the temperatures are the same inside as outside. That oh, means, okay. so let's say we get into about mid-September and it's like, okay, I got to bring these in because, you know, we're getting close. You know, end of September, anything could happen. It could get a little frosty. You never know. Not likely, but you never know. So uh, then you just watch your, you know, your indoor temperature maybe is 23 degrees Celsius. Then uh, when you, you see your nighttime, you wake up in the morning, it's plus 10 outside Celsius. And then by about 2 o'clock, it hits 23. Boom, that's the time. Get so that plant when out. the temperature's the same and bring it into the house so that it doesn't have a, a big temperature shock. flux. Yes. Like a shock. Okay, because yeah. it's hanging out on the deck and it's it stays out there all the time. So mm-hmm. even these nights that are getting cooler, is it still okay out there or should I bring it in at night? They're pretty good. Our, I leave ours out right to the last minute. But then, of course, I don't put mine in the house. I put it in the greenhouse. So, oh, uh, yes. So. I okay. have a greenhouse, and you don't. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. bad, Don. That's bad. So the <laughs> other thing I was wondering is, it's in this one size pot, like the, I don't know, maybe it's 8 or 10 inches across. Mm-hmm. So I suspect that there are two or three plants in that mm-hmm. pot. Is it possible to um, put it in a bigger pot if it's one plant, or split it up if it's pretty pretty difficult to split it uh there, you it? could have it could be a plant that originally had three cuttings in there and, and they're going to be really uh, the roots are going to be quite a quagmire in there and it's going to be hard to yeah. separate them especially at this time of year if you want to do some separation uh vicky i would suggest waiting till spring till spring yeah, yeah. and then okay. how you would but, do that is to wash the soil off the roots in the springtime and separate each one very carefully mm-hmm. by teasing them apart Okay. And, but even that, if you if you did wash the soil off and find that they all join together in one spot, it, you're taking a big chance kind yep. of dealing with it. Okay. I would personally just keep it as yep. one plant. Keep it as and a plant. So it would be root-bound, and it's happy to be root-bound then in that smaller pot? You know, a lot of or, things. I mean, bonsai. <laughs> Think of bonsais. I mean, how root-bound they are. I mean, well, What it is is about how, how often you have to water it, right? Yeah. yeah. So when you have yeah. plants that are root-bound, then they need to be watered really super consistently. Mm. But if you have plants that are in slightly bigger pots, then they're a little more forgiving. But remember oh. that when you go into winter, you don't water as much anyway. So Okay. So I could go, say, an inch around bigger pot? Yeah, so that's that it would have typically... Some fresh soil. You, you could, yeah. Um, typically what we do with that is uh, when we're going inside, uh, they do get a little stressed when you first bring them in, as Don was saying, that they can defoliate and have some other little stress reactions of going inside. But once they stabilize inside, you just want to keep them stable right through mo- most of the winter. And then when you're getting into March and the days are getting longer and the sun's getting a little brighter, that's a good time to do your transplant. And then I'd be looking at that one to two inches bigger as a pot. Uh, And then, you know, you might have a new plan next year and put it in with a bunch of other plants, like in a larger pot. And I use it as a specimen on a little trellis or something, right? Okay, thank you very much. All righty. I'll do that in March. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks, Vicky. Take care. Bye-bye. We're going to take a short break here. It's the bottom of the hour, and we've got Dan Bruce waiting for us uh, on the line. And uh, we will talk to him when we come back with The Garden Show after this short break. We're back with you uh, on the AM... Pardon me. We're back with you with The Garden Show. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, we're broadcasting from the AM 1150 studios downtown Kelowna, but we are welcoming and really enjoy having our friends in Victoria on board here listening Mm -hmm. to the show as well. And uh, on that note, we're going to uh, talk to Dan Bruce. Good morning, Dan. Good morning. Good morning. It is a very pleasant morning. It is. It's lovely. The plants are are starting to get their second wind now. And before anything else, on behalf of the Friends of Finchley Society, I want to extend an enormous thanks to the Northwest Side Firefighters. Fintry has stood through a number of fires in my lifetime, Mm -hmm. 
and um, we appreciate all the efforts that they have made. Well, in particular this time, Dan, because so many of those uh, people lost their own homes. Exactly. And that, that's um, a tough story to tell. But that, that's, that is, yeah. is that something that, and, and I mean, unless it's close to you, you can't really imagine. No. Well, um, so, uh, yeah, so let's uh, talk gardening. Moving on from there, mm-hmm. um, last year I planted a large um, pot on the, on the veranda here, uh, planted um, scarlet runner beans, right. and they grew up and festooned that end of the veranda. Um, but I didn't get a single bean, mm-hmm. <laughs> not one. This year I did the same thing, uh, same species, same pot. Mm-hmm. And this Sucker for I punishment, have... are you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, at first you don't succeed. Yeah. <laughs> um, Try one more time. <laughs> so this year I've got about 25 beans. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. So, so almost, a, almost a meal? That's, that's pretty much a meal if you, yeah. um, if you don't... Um, don't let them get too big mm-hmm. because you eat the whole bean. I mean, you slice it and mm-hmm. eat the whole pod and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, the issue, I think, last year is that there were no bumblebees. Oh, right. okay. Mm-hmm. Because it's the bumblebee especially that um, pollinates the scarlet runner. Interesting. Um I mean, you see a lot of other insects sort of buzzing around them, mm-hmm. and, and um, hummingbirds certainly um, check them out too. Mm-hmm. But I don't think there's any pollination until you get a um, a bee. Mm-hmm. Well, not that you're an entomologist or anything, Dan, but is a bumblebee native to this area? Um, that I'm not sure of, mm-hmm. but they're obviously um, the bumblebee is one that certainly gets the job done. But in Mexico, there must be, um, no pun intended, (laughs) 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 the bees that do it. Mm -hmm. Because Mm -hmm. that is where the scarlet runner is native to. Okay. And and for those who are into common names, by the way, in the Aztec language, uh, the, the word for this plant is etl. That's easily spelt, E T L. Hmm. E E T L. Etel. 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 You kind you kind yeah. of swallow that last yeah. T L. Yeah, you do. Mm-hmm. Dan. But anyway, always uh, interesting uh, to talk to you. Now we've got a couple of callers waiting to get on here. So uh, if you've got something you want to spit out real quick, do it. <laughs> I'm going to try keeping the roots of these beans over winter this year in the same way that you do dahlias. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. Because that can be done. Really? Yes. Because they're a perennial, of course, down in Mexico. Yes. Yeah. There you go. That is. So oh, now I... everybody's going to be digging up their Scarlet Runner bean roots and put them in, in the basement. I can just tell. Well, <laughs> try something. Try it out. Yeah. <laughs> and if you don't succeed, try one more time like try Dan did. One more time. Dan. Third, <laughs> third time lucky. Thanks, yeah, okay, buddy. That's it. Pop in. I, I'd love to show you some things going on. Yes, and I have yeah. to reclaim my cactus. And you do. I've got it on the mm. bench there. Yeah. I've watered it once since you were. I took the uh, opportunity to make sure it got watered once, and that's all it needed. So, Good. Okay, sir. Thank you. Talk to you later. You betcha. Dan, take bye-bye care. now. Mm, bye-bye. And we have uh, Pat joining us. Good morning, Pat. Good morning, gentlemen. I love the show. Listen to it every Saturday. Thank you, dear. And- um, my question is, I have tea roses that are about five feet tall, and um, when I lived in Vancouver, we were told to trim them down in the spring after the forsythia come out. But up here in West Kelowna, mm-hmm. I don't know whether I should leave them on during the winter and trim them in the spring or trim them in the fall. You know, I, I would suggest... Uh, what I do is I just tidy them up in the fall. Mm-hmm. I do the heavy pruning in the spring, but I tidy them up. And if they're hybrid teas, you probably would like, you should cover them with something. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. You know, because they are more susceptible to freezing. Although, I must say, my uh, I've got one hybrid tea rose. All the rest of them are more 
uh, floribundas and, and uh, that sort of thing, species roses. Um, but my hybrid tea is called Just Joey, yeah. and uh, it is a beauty. It's an apricot kind of a color. I gorgeous. love those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, last year, we lost yeah. so many things in the garden, and uh, we didn't lose that guy, and yeah. I didn't, didn't cover him. So, you know, it's... Uh, we pull out probably hundreds of, of dead roses every mm-hmm. year, yeah. all the hybrid teas that die over winter because they don't get protected. So... I would just say go ahead and yeah, protect I would, them, I would and that's protect. just that. I protect actually all roses, even if they're hardy, and they just love mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. You know, so I mulch them up about maybe about 12 to 18 inches high with a beautiful sort of coarse composty mulch. Like uh, here in the Okanagan, we sometimes use that Nature's Gold product, and um, it's just perfect. You bury the plant. Not until in dawn. That's your tip, too, is you always say, Wait until you're like literally into November Mm -hmm, and you're starting to get good hard frost at night. And then that's when you go out with your bag of mulch and bury each rose up. Mm -hmm. And then that just protects it to make sure that 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 part, maybe about 10 inches above the ground, are saved Mm -hmm. through the winter. And then next spring, you clean it off and just cut the whole plant down to about that 10 inches high. And the thing will just shoot up and do its thing again and uh, everything will be good. Well, that's lovely. Thank you so much. My my roses are all uh, got rocks around the bottoms of them. Yeah. So if I push those rocks back and then put the mulch. That's what or... I would do. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, let's face it. Ken and I are both anti-rock, but, but that's. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. Well, not rock and roll. We do, we love rock and roll, but, <laughs> but rocks and landscaping is not. Yeah. Anyway, we <laughs> love you. Take Care. Thank you for the call. We appreciate and it. Thank you very much. Okay, gentlemen. dear. Thanks. Okay, bye bye. You betcha. Bye-bye. And we mm. have time uh, for Andre for a couple of minutes. Andre, good morning. Oh, good morning. Thank you for taking my call. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have a question regarding hydrangeas. Uh, I live in uh, Victoria. Yep. And uh, about a month ago, I took some hydrangeas uh, cutting and put, uh, put them in the uh, earth and uh, keeping them wet for a month. Mm-hmm been a month or five weeks now and uh i can see that they're starting to uh develop some roots nice and i'm just wondering if i transplant them because right now they're in small containers if i transplant them in larger container what do i do with them over the winter what first of all what type of hydrangea is it oh i don't know like they're is like it the yeah. blue big the big blue they, well they, they, uh, pink? they may have been blue at one time but I keep them red because of, I use okay. PA I use uh, yeah macrophyll yeah. yeah okay well that's good to know um yeah so it's they should be fine if you could do you have the opportunity to just plant them into the ground outside or well I could plant some yes yeah, yeah. Uh, that's what I think I would do is I would get them into their natural environment and get them establishing because uh, you, you know in in your area uh, you've got uh, several months yet to go before winter actually comes in and so they should right. have time to establish and um, because when you have plants in pots they're up out of the ground and it's kind of finicky they tend to dry out too much or they can be sometimes they can be overwatered or they can be get too cold or get too hot and so when they're in the ground they they get this sort of a natural environment where the roots are a constant uh, stable temperature and if it if it rains a lot that's okay the extra water drains away and if it's if it's dry, usually they can send out more roots to search for water. So it's just a better situation to have them established in the garden. Yeah, and also they're protected because there's a, uh, an extension of the front of the house there. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, beautiful. And, yeah, so that's and it's the north side. Do they uh, uh, do they thrive better on the north side, or do they uh, want more sun? I think in your area they they prefer a little bit more sun. Uh, uh, here yeah. in the Okanagan, they need to be protected a little bit from the real brunt of our sun, because we do have a different right. different situation there. Yeah, so we plant sort okay. of here. We we plant north and east side, and um, and sometimes I, I have seen them growing in full sun here, yeah. and they they are okay as long as they have a good water supply. But in coastal areas, often they'll work in almost any location, but they seem to perform best with a little bit of sun. Yeah, they bloom bloom a little better if they have a lot uh, more light. Okay, okay. Well, thank you very much, Andre. Thanks for the call, and, and uh, nice luck. to hear you from Victoria. Take care. Have a good day. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. We're going to take a, another short break here. We've got uh, Brian on 
on the waiting list here. He will be on as soon as we come back with the Garden Show after this short break. We are here uh, with you every Saturday morning, have been doing this since 1983 when I was three years old. Yep. <laughs> I started the show when I was three, um, just learning how to talk and garden. You figured, well, let's let's try this with a microphone. <laughs> right. and, so, three-year-old. Mm-hmm. It's like Buddy Rich started, he was on the road at three years old. Anyway, yep. <laughs> playing drums. Uh, we have uh, joining us right now, we have joining us, um, Brian. Good morning, Brian. Good morning. Good morning. Hey. How are we doing today? Uh, good, good. Um, I live in Kelowna here, and in my backyard I have about a four-foot retaining wall, and above the retaining wall I have an area that's 60 feet by 12 feet. It's on a hillside. Mm-hmm. And I'm getting up in age, and I was it's all in black dirt now, and I was wondering what kind of a seeding flower or something that goes back every year that I can plant on the hillside that's got little little maintenance. Um I've got a sprinkler system in it, so I don't have to, I can automatically water it. That would go back every year that um, I'm getting up in age, and just so I'm not flipping on the hillside or something, trying to maintain it. Um, I'm just wondering if there's some kind of flowering seed or something I could plant there. Well, yeah, what's, what the issue is, is anytime you get anything uh, on a hillside or a slope, is you, you pretty much have to be able to get up there and do maintenance to it to be able to weed yeah. and work it. Um, yeah. You know, trying to put some sort of rock on there or something or to put fabric uh, generally mm-hmm. is an issue when you have fabric on a st- slope like that. All the water hits that and shoots straight to the bottom. Yeah. And then you can have washouts and that sort of thing. So yeah. it's it's a tough situation. I think it has to be thought out very carefully. And if you do use, like, flowering plants, then you're you're going to have to weed. In you're going to have them. to be up there. And that's going to be regular. So Brian, you, you don't really. Yeah. You have to be what careful. Um, are you hooked on wanting to have color flowers and things like that, or would you be okay with a blanket of green? Uh, well, my wife was looking for flowers, but yeah. a blanket of green would would. Um, I just want something that um, yeah. that I can cover it because it's uh, just right. black dirt now. I mean, I've been really happy with a juniper called uh, Prince of Wales. I've got that one Prince of Wales in my front bed and it's you can walk on it you can it's 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 low it lays really flat um it's hardy the the deer don't eat it um there's all sorts of uh good things about it but there's no color of course maybe you could have at the base just on the top of the wall plant a, a row of um of, of flowering plants like red beckias or yeah. something like or that or what you can do too is you can put in larger upright growing shrubs that bloom and as long as you can run some sort of irrigation, like overhead sprinkling could become an issue on a slope like that. So yeah, converting uh, to a drip line would be the way to go for sure. Yeah, it's only 12 feet wide, so yeah. it's not... What it's degree not, of slope do you have? Oh, it's, um, I would say, probably 30 degrees. Yeah, maybe. so it's a slope. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's a slope. Yeah, it's a little bit challenging, but you can imagine, say, this this big flat area full with the green junipers with these flowering shrubs growing out of it, like only maybe three or something, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, but some larger shrubs that bloomed, maybe like the Rose of Sharon or like the uh, Butterfly Bush, which is a beauty that blooms all summer. They're going to need some maintenance at some point. And then, as Don was saying, maybe along the bottom, you, you could either grow some annuals for some color or add in some other long blooming uh, perennial of some sort, because then it's easy to maintain that bottom part, and the upper part would only need once a year sort of access. How about uh, someone said time? Um, well, that'll yeah. need a pretty regular weeding, yeah. It steady, will, I, yeah. steady weeding, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, a, it's not going to challenge. The one thing about the Prince of Wales juniper, um, uh, the only thing we've had happen with it is a, a little bit of grassy uh, quack grass coming through it but not very much for the mm-hmm. most part there's not a weed that comes through it yeah but yeah. It, there's a period of time from when you plant it and three or four oh, yeah. years you to still have to maintain it then first three or yeah. four years you're gonna have to yeah. really yeah. Uh, keep the weeds no out. magic uh ted i wish we had a ma- or, or brian i wish i guess there is a good product a shot crete 
<laughs> just spray the whole hillside with shot. Yeah, just spray and, the whole side, hillside. And then spray it with, or then do a beautiful or a painting of some flowers yeah, yeah. or something. <laughs> that that would work. Okay. Yeah, wish we had our magic wand for you today, yep. but unfortunately we don't. Okay, well, thank you very okay, much for the info. Enjoy your show. Yeah, thank you, sir. Thanks for Take calling care. in. Yeah, appreciate thank it. You bet. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, yes, now, uh, I got names mixed up there. That was Ted. Uh, oh, Ted's on the line now. That was Brian. Boy, That's I'll Brian. tell you, this this old man is starting to lose it here. Uh, <laughs> Ted, good morning, Ted. Uh, yeah, I think that's me. <laughs> <laughs> Are you sure? <laughs> uh, uh, good morning, guys. I have two questions. Um, I'm going to ask the questions, then I'm going to hang up and listen to your answer on the radio because I can hear you better. Mm-hmm. Two questions. What have you got against rocks and rock gardens? <laughs> And the second question is hydrangeas. You mentioned uh, there's different types uh, yes. regarding that. I, I understand that people can change the color of the flowers yeah. from, from white or yellow to red or blue. No. Well. How do they do that? And I guess finally, uh, what's the best time to layer cuttings from hydrangeas? So okay. that. That's what area are you do you, uh, do you live in, Ted? Victoria. In Victoria, okay. okay. Uh, okay. So the rock question, uh, the the hydrangea question, like w- what types of hydrangeas are there out there, and how do you change the color, and the um, uh, and how do you how do you uh, root hydrangeas? Right, mm-hmm. that's what you want to know. We okay. can do that uh, if you if uh, I mean. If you want to stay on the line, we can we can do it very quickly here because uh, we got about three minutes left before we have to take the break. But well, I can hear you a lot better over yep. the radio. Okay, okay, well then, okay, we'll we'll answer those questions for you if you want to hang up. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, Bye-bye. Ted, right on. Thanks for calling. Yeah. Okay, the rock issue. Ken yep. and I are gardeners. Okay. Mm-hmm. And when you lay landscape fabric down and put rock on top of it, it it's not it, gardening. You can't garden. Yeah. No, you can't garden. Because <laughs> gardening requires that that you know getting in, moving plants, dividing, and and yep. working in the garden. So. Gardeners just like to have nice composts on the surface so they can go out and move yeah. plants and plant new stuff and then divide things. It's work, you know, but it, hey, it's, it's fabulous. And we're not it's totally gardening. against it, but no. one of the couple of reasons why we don't prefer doing that uh, is, first of all, it's not a panacea that a lot of people look for, mm-hmm. that weed seeds do come and they start landing in between the rocks and growing in the gravel. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't really hoe those weeds out. It, you know, it's a difficult mm-hmm. thing to once... After a few years, it gets to be quite a mess. Then the secondly is uh, that the plants themselves with the landscape fabric and that don't do as well because uh, landscape fabric and, and rock is not like your natural forest litter. Yeah, it kind of suffocates yeah. the soil a little bit. Three types, main three types of hydrangeas, uh, three main ones, uh, the macrophyllum, which is the one that you will find a lot down the coast more than the Okanagan. And it's and the that, only one that you can change the full the that's flower right, color. That's right. There's, you can't change the colors on any of the varieties except for the macrophylla, which are the big pink or blue ones. And that's the general color options are pink or blue. Uh, they are pink in an alkaline condition, and they are blue in an acid condition because of aluminum uptake. So in acid conditions, aluminum is freely available to get the, absorbed by the roots, which change the flowers to blue. And in alkaline conditions, the aluminum is locked, and it's very uh, simple that way. And we do, in the Okanagan here, we use aluminum sulfate, which has sulfur that acidifies in aluminum that changes the color blue. And we apply that every week or two and turn the flowers blue. All right, we're getting right yep. down to the end, but the last thing is just propagation of hydrangeas. You do it in the summertime, hardwood cuttings. Around the beginning of August is a good time to take your cuttings, and you can direct stick them, put them into pots. All shrubbery are often done at August 1st, and by now they're rooted. Boy, if we got that down, Pat. We did three questions right off the bat. We've only got a few seconds left before we have to take the break. And um, that's what we're going to do. We uh, love being here every Saturday morning, and we really enjoy having our Victoria listeners uh, listening in as well. And, um, yeah, on that note, we're going to uh, take take, a break for the news. Take a break for the news. And uh, we will be back with The Garden Show after this short break.
You betcha. We are here every Saturday morning, and it's nice to have Jaden here this morning. Uh, he is waving his arms and a uh, happy boy. He's a happy camper. Uh, last night, we had a wonderful visit <coughs> with our son, Joseph, and his mm. his mate, uh, his uh, partner, uh, Sabrina. And we sat around the fire pit last night. We lit the fire pit for the first time this year. Yeah. Uh, this fall, I should say. We, in the spring, we had it. And we'll we'll use that little fire pit there probably right through uh, even when it's snowing outside it's so nice because we've got the covering there it's really well, quite it's a nice. beautiful thing with the gas is it doesn't yeah. have doesn't have the sparks and whatnot that well that's right and, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm, we when i say fire pit it's a gas fire pit yeah. uh safe and and and, and sound and and what oh and ken i've got on our our uh, patio table mm-hmm. a sample about about a two inch chunk of bark blackened Ooh. bark mm-hmm. uh, you know where we live on ronda crescent and yep. uh that's where the embers were that's how far the embers were flying oh yeah on that thursday uh two weeks ago mm-hmm. uh thursday i'm telling you it was it was rough yep that's yep. a very scary situation that's for sure yeah and, and, and still not over for a lot of people they're still having issues up in uh, oh of, the of course Glen the fire's not out the yeah. fire is not out it's uh, yeah. it's it's, 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 really it's a long term thing hopefully the weather will change we get some more rain mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff and uh, we'll all get through this and get get into winter mm-hmm. and uh and then we can start planning gardening for next year you know uh, i'm going to talk about uh, we've got uh, um addy calling in we want to talk to addy but after that i want to talk about uh weed seeds and mm-hmm. crabgrass again. We'll talk about crabgrass and weed yep. seeds because it's almost too late for the crabgrass. Although you, you taking the crabgrass out now is going to be beneficial, yeah, but they're already the seeds are dropping. On oh the crabgrass. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah, it's too late. It's kind of too late, but still wise to do it because yeah. you will get quite a few. You still remove over fifty percent of the seed. And we want to say good morning to Addy. Nice to have you on board here, Addy. How are you doing? Good morning, guys. I'm doing fine. That's Sounds like you guys are off to a good start as well. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just have one little tip, and that's for Brian. What mm-hmm. about white lace on that, on that bank that he's got? White, white lace. White lace. Yeah. What, what kind of white lace? Well, it's, it's, it's just a shrub. Oh, I, it's silver maybe, lace vine, maybe. Is silver it? lace vine, that's it. I'm sorry. Right. I've always called it white lace because mm-hmm. a neighbor of mine called it white lace, and we had it. On our well, they had it on there, and it was fabulous. Mm-hmm. It grows quite thick too. It like grows it's... thick and it grows quickly, and mm-hmm. it also flowers the whole year through. The little white flowers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're still in bloom right now. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just mm-hmm. wondering about about that sort of for the upper bench for him. Yeah, the the thing with the silver lace vine, they call it a mile minute vine because it literally yeah. it can grow twenty or thirty feet in a single. You know, each shoot in in a season, they can cover yeah. quite a big area. Um, and they are sometimes grown on banks where you plant them at the bottom of the bank and kind of train them up a little bit, and they'll grow sort of on the upward direction typically. Um, and, you know, they, they're they fine. And the beauty with that is you can just water at the base of the hill or wherever the root is and just let yeah. the top run. The, their only minor uh, issue with those vines is that the mice will eat the bark from them. And so I have seen big plantings of them being damaged by mice, uh, but that's not insurmountable. I mean, mm-hmm. a few uh, most uh, bait traps each fall. It's always in the fall when the mice mm-hmm. start moving around. So, yeah. you know, yeah. that's when you want to start putting out your base trap or your your bait traps, and uh, yeah, get on it. I'd say by the end of September, you got to be on trapping. But if you had junipers, you want to do the same. If you have uh, pretty much anything that's like a massive ground cover, you're going to get uh, rodents living underneath that. So just be prepared and take care of that biz and the rest of it's easy okay now to my question mm-hmm. should i be bringing my cactuses out no I you're talking so. the slumbergia the uh, the christmas Just cactus all the all the cactus no not the christmas cactus oh, yeah. the cactuses that you know the the cactus cactuses that need warm weather i put them all outside yeah. and um should I be bringing them in now, or, is, or can I still yeah. wait? It's your call. I, I think probably end of September would be adequate for them. Uh, end of September. Yeah. Same with okay. the the, the uh, Christmas cactus. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's just, we, you know, we're getting these cold nights right now, but um, I don't think that's going to continue. 
But, you, you know, I just watch the weather forecast, and uh, yeah. as long as it's, say, plus 5 or better, they should be fine. Uh, many cacti uh, that, that live in, uh, you know, sort of the southern U.S. and, and in that sort of area, they um, they can actually, they freeze sometimes at night in those areas. So depending where the cactus is from, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the Schlumbergias, as Don was saying, or that group um, of any of the Christmas cactus or Easter cactus, they really... Uh, they should be kept uh, away from the frost, if at all possible. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So that's now, my more. next question. Hydrangea, you were saying that the microfolia, phallia, whatever, mm-hmm. is, is not really conducive to our area. Uh, yeah. They're a little touchy. They are subject to frost damage in this area, and we've been having it for the last three years straight. And so we haven't been getting the blooming that we should. And so all I'm going to suggest is that we protect them. We grow hybrid tea roses here, and we mulch them and protect those every fall. So we need to do the same with our macrophylla hydrangeas and protect them. It's just that we want to protect a little bit more of the plant. So I like to have something more like a little, either a piece of fencing or something around them, and then stuff it full of a some sort of insulative material, whether it's a mulch of some sort. or uh, Leaves are okay. I don't think it's quite quite protective enough with leaves but um some you know insulation of some sort would be ideal okay so what what are the hydrangeas that you can grow here because i've got a a piece that i need to be putting a hydrangea in and i like the big big white ones what are those yeah the annabelle ones are the are the really nice big white ones and they're fine they can survive in severely cold temperatures and dry and all that they're very tough so uh, any of the Annabelle types uh, and any of the PG hydrangea types are just fine. So there's quite a few that grow here without any issue whatsoever. Okay. Uh, my next question. Can an iris uh, survive the winter in a pot? Yes. Irises survive in pots. No problem. So the, when, like, you know, when they're planted in the ground, you can see the roots of them. Mm-hmm. Should you be covering them with soil for the winter, or can they be um, exposed? They're fine, just exposed. Actually, yeah, you can. So they don't need any ground cover, any soil cover. No, and and uh, you know, if we're talking mainly about the German irises, um, yeah. they're, they're the ones that are really bulletproof. And you know, uh, all the ones that I have in the garden, I don't do anything with them in the winter. And you can see the roots right on the surface. And they're fine to freeze or thaw. And, and have being a, a grower in the past, I've grown thousands and thousands of irises in pots. And, you know, that was a plant that we really didn't have to put away for the winter. We could just leave them sitting literally straight outside in their pots and exposed to all the elements. And they were just fine. They come through fine. Okay, last question. My oleander plant, is it sort of the same thing and bring it in the end of September? Yes, yep, both yep, same. Yep, they'll take the and cool. Use it, keep it as a house plant in a sunny location, or yeah, growing because they are evergreen. You know, they're they're predominantly evergreen, uh, so okay. they will keep their leaves through the winter. So they will need some light. So the direct sunlight won't won't damage them or anything like no, that. No. We had a, a an oleander hedge in Bermuda. I used to trim it. Mm. Yeah, so they're so fine. They're fine in bright light. Sun. You bet. Sunny window. Sunny window's perfect. Okay, super. You guys are the greatest. Thank you very much. Have a great long weekend. Addy, you as well. Take care. Take care. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye bye. And we're inviting and welcoming Ronnie to the show. Good morning, Ronnie. Hi, Bob of Cassie Garden. Yes. Yes. There you go. And um, it's Ronnie, not Ron. And yeah. Right, that. right. I don't know why, why we had that. Uh, Ron is phoning in, but uh, but Ronnie, you're you're much better than Ron. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, I'm phoning with. Re- there's a few things going on in the garden, mm-hmm. but I'll I'll just do the art show fundraiser today. Yes. Um, Abkhazie Garden hosts local artists um, throughout the summer mm-hmm. as part of the Plein Air Artists in the Garden program. Mm-hmm. So they bring their easels and paints and chair and set up as long as they're not on the pathways, you know, right. getting in the way of people visiting the garden. Right. And they paint the most beautiful scenes from the garden. It's, it's just wonderful. They're going to be there on Labor Day Monday between mm-hmm. 11 and 4. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'll be showing their paintings and, and selling their artwork late in the garden. So they'll talk about their paintings if you want them to. 
And those paintings will be then moved into the tea house, mm-hmm. tea room, and in the gift shop from September the 6th to October the 8th. So you can come in any time then and um, purchase any of the paintings that you want. Anyone who is local who is purchasing a painter, painting, they prefer that you pick it up after October the 8th or 9th because yeah. mm-hmm. otherwise there won't be any paintings left for people to right. view. <laughs> right. You want to yeah, keep them there. Yeah. So uh, it, some of the paintings are absolutely wonderful. I went last year and I purchased a painting. Mm-hmm. So I have that proudly displayed in my home. So, um, yeah, it's it's just a great event. Um, paintings that are sold, half the profits go back to the garden to maintain the garden, and the other half goes to the artists themselves. So mm, they all seem to really enjoy coming to such a peaceful setting to, to paint the beautiful the beautiful scene. So mm-hmm. next week I'll call in about the um, the grandparents' day and the plant sale. Oh, fabulous. Ronnie, fabulous. But not, let's just, uh, Abkhazi Gardens, uh, Just I, we haven't got uh, much time before we have to take a break, but just tell us the address. Uh, 1964 Fairfield Road. This and, is, yeah, in Victoria. And if you, if you Google Abkhazi Garden, the website will come up. So it's A B K H A Z I, and where does the name Abkhazi come from? Abkhazi is from part of Georgia. Oh, hmm. like in in Europe n- near Russia. Okay, oh, okay. Interesting. So that's where it, it's a oh, there's an incredible, beautiful story about how the garden got started and everything. The per, the property was actually purchased by Peggy Pemberton. Yep. She became princess. Okay, now look it, we've got to take a break, but okay. I would love it, if Ken and I would love it if you phone in again at some point, maybe not today, but uh, maybe next week when we're talking more about the, about the events there. You bet. And give us a history of the gardens, because it's really cool, okay? Thanks, thanks. Ronnie. And Ken. Yeah, thanks for calling. You betcha, take care. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Yeah, there you go. We've got to take a short break, and we will be back with the Garden Show after this short break. <laughs> You betcha. We are back with you on the uh, Garden Show, uh, t- speaking to you both in the Okanagan area, the Kelowna area, and the Victoria area. And we welcome our folks, our listening audience from all over the place. We appreciate that very much. Um, yeah, so I've got Elaine Cameron's, uh, uh, her diary from uh, Sept- for September 1950 here. Uh, September 1st, um, there in 1950, it says, hot. <laughs> mm-hmm. Hot. September 2nd, watering, cut lawns, edges with the mower. Mm-hmm. And uh, now this is interesting, Ken. Here she's got September uh, 3rd and 4th, sunny, yep. no garden. In other words, she's not gardening that day because they have the Jim Canna and confusion. <laughs> the Jim Canna was a, was a, a they, they had horses. Right. And uh, the folks, uh, you know, the Bennett. The Bennett family had horses as well, uh, R.J. Bennett. And, mm-hmm. and they would do this jumping and and ho- horsey things. You know? Yeah. <laughs> Whatever they... <laughs> Equestrian events. Sort Equest- of there it is. Equestrian events. It wasn't, it wasn't like uh, a rodeo or something. Like no. <laughs> it wasn't any bucking broncos. These are all mostly thoroughbreds. Mm-hmm. Um, and perhaps even some polo, that kind of stuff, right? Jim Canna. And uh, so that... Reminds me, because I remember when I was a kid, when I was a youngster, mm-hmm. and I lived in the area, uh, oh, yeah, the cameras are having their Jim Canna today. And I, oh, interesting. I, I, I didn't quite understand what that Jim Canna was all about. Anyway, mm. I do now. Uh, September 5th, cut flowers for Shep and Daisy. These are friends of hers. Watering the sunken garden. And uh, picked and shelled three pints of limas for the locker. Now, she mentions the locker. That was the frozen food locker on Leon Avenue in Kelowna here. Ah, right. And I don't know whether folks in in Victoria had a frozen locker place where you would take take uh, food, take your produce. Most and likely, I guess. Meat and things in those like days. That. What, what year was that again? 1950. 1950. Uh, and that fr- frozen food locker was there right through the 50s and maybe even into the 60s until people right. started, most people who would have freezers, right? right? The frozen food locker took the place of a freezer. 
And uh, it was kind of mm. kind of a fun thing in the summer for us kids to go to the frozen food locker and pick up some stuff, you know, mm. that mom had stored there. And there's big wooden frame uh, lockers uh, each person had where you could open the door and put your stuff in and lock it up so nobody took your stuff. Nice. And um, we'd get to wear our winter clothes in the middle of the summer. <laughs> we'd go in there and it was like it was freezing. It was, it, was a, it was like walking into a freezer. Yep. And, uh, yeah, so that's the frozen food locker. Uh, September 11th, hot, irrigating. So, you know, it was hot that year, Mm -hmm. in that year. Uh, 49 and 50, though, this is the spring and summer of 1950, in the fall of 1950. Mm -hmm. But the winter before was one of the coldest winters that uh, Kelowna had ever experienced. 4950. 4950. My dad often talked, oh, the winter of 4950 was really something. That was one of the years they were driving across the lake? Yeah. They were actually going across the lake on, on vehicles would, would drive over the lake. Yeah. And, it's uh, frozen right over. Yeah. The Okanagan Lake is, is massively deep and it, it doesn't freeze. <laughs> Very it's seldom. It's not, freeze, not yeah. easy to yeah. freeze. It that has lake. to have certain conditions mm-hmm. to, to freeze. And once it does freeze and if the weather stays cold like it did in 4950, it freezes solid enough that you can actually walk out there. And, mm-hmm. and, but often, uh, you know, winters are cold enough that it freezes out. 30, 40, 50 feet, and people will go up and ice skate on the lake in that weather, which is funny. Yeah. Yep. The smaller <clears throat> lakes are a little bit easier to deal with. Safe. Yeah. <laughs> um, Van Fleet, and I've looked it up. A van, she cut the, cut the Van Fleet rose off the fence. Van mm. Fleet. And I don't know, I've, I've tried to find out what that was doing. Anyway, Henry began work on the fence, picked five Pint, uh, five pints of beans for the locker again. They keep, she keeps putting these uh, uh, beans in the locker, the mm-hmm. uh, frozen food locker. And uh, then the 13th and 14th, uh, Mrs. Wilmot and I, meaning Elaine, went to the Armstrong Fair. Now it's called the IPE, right. the Interior Provincial Exhibition. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, it, I still call it the Armstrong Fair. <laughs> I, I mm-hmm. can't help it. Um Anyway, there you have it. And uh, this this uh, goes right through to September 27th, 28th, 29th, and 30th. And it says, no garden, a baby here. Uh, the baby mm-hmm. would have been uh, one of Elaine's grandchildren mm-hmm. uh, born in 1950 like I was. And I forget which one it was. Um, uh, it wasn't Ian. Ian just passed away a short time ago. Uh, but Ian was a little younger than me. I think Ian was three years younger. He's, he was my brother's age. Right. Yeah. So there we go. It's it's really nice. Now, I have a diary uh, that I use in my greenhouse. I just call it the <laughs> greenhouse log. Yep. It's not nearly as, as detailed, and it's not nearly as consistent as Elaine, and I'm going to try a little yeah. better to be consistently writing. Mm-hmm. I'll go and do something in, in, in the greenhouse or in the garden and... and uh, forget to write it down and then the next year when did i do that i'd look it up oh i didn't write it down you know Mm -hmm. writing a a diary down for your gardening whether you have a greenhouse or not uh just the garden diary is so uh so useful and uh interesting because you can look back and see what you did at a certain time Mm -hmm. uh see when you brought certain things in see when you put certain things out um, I do it enough that uh, that I have a little bit of that joy, but uh, not enough. I got I've got to be a little yeah. more consistent. I like to yeah. see uh, things like when it comes to temperature. You know, that something that's sort of graphed yep. a little bit. That's always fun to look at over time, especially when you have a greenhouse like mm-hmm. you do. Is and you do track the temperature. I do. The, I do. The, I consistently every morning take my coffee out to the greenhouse, and I look at how cold it got last night, how hot it got in the daytime. So I got the high and the low inside the greenhouse, high and the low outside the greenhouse. Perfect. Um, but other than that, <clears throat> uh, that's consistent. Mm-hmm. But writing stuff down and, and, and documenting some of the things that I do. Yeah. You know, a lot of the stuff, I, I say I sowed such and such onions or seed or whatever mm-hmm. the date. Uh, took some cuttings of this or that. And uh, But now it's the uh, planning, uh, the uh, winter, uh, you know, mm-hmm. I, as much as I... I appreciate this time of year i do get a little anxious because we know what's around the corner we know Mm -hmm. some of the stuff that has to get done and um you know bring in the dahlias and and 
just do uh, you know cover up the fig tree mm-hmm. oh have i got some nice figs this year Ken. yeah you saw i've sent them and i've dried yeah. them i've tried dried these figs nice and uh yeah tasty, you're drying everything this tasty year. i'm drying everything yeah i have prepared a video that that you and i did last weekend oh about yeah. the drying of the mm-hmm. fruit and um and the mm. making of raisins and that sort of thing and uh i haven't quite finished it so I'm well good because i it. haven't sent you those pictures either yeah. I want to send. I want to email those pictures to you. That would be awesome. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. then uh, that way I can wrap that up and get it out mm-hmm. on YouTube, and then uh, everybody can have a look at uh, yeah the fruit drying process. But they're sure delicious, especially those cherries. Oh my god, mm-hmm. they're just uh, like candies. They're so lovely and sweet and tasty mm-hmm. and delicious. And you know, when you reach for something sweet, you, you, for me, I I I don't really like the overly processed stuff, you know, or, mm-hmm. or artificial. And if you can have something like that, that's the closest thing to candy you can yeah. you could get. It's they're so good, and yet uh, it's just real food. We took a bag out to uh, Dominic the other day, and he he said he sits and watches his TV and snacks on dried cherries. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah very nice. So you now cherry season is now I think officially over for the season. You you can still get a little here and there. But yeah, it's, they're, they're, they're still shipping a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, but very little now. But, uh, boy, it's amazing how long the cherry season does last. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they were open uh, last weekend. Last weekend, yeah. yeah last was... weekend was their last weekend they were, they were open. So mm-hmm. pretty amazing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Two yeah. five, yeah, two five zero eight six two two five two five to get through to us here locally and one eight eight eight. Seven eight zero four two seven three. If you're in the Victoria listening area, or anywhere online, give us a call. We love to talk to you. And at that point in time, we've got to take a break at the bottom of the hour. Here, we'll be back with the Garden Show after this short break. Okay, and, and again, we're going to mention uh, for the Victoria listeners uh, that the Abkhazi Gardens uh, at 1964 Fairfield Road in Victoria uh, is having their events coming up now, and uh, that's great. I've got to, I've got to go visit those gardens, uh, not tonight, but uh, at some point we yeah. will get over mm-hmm. there and see them. And um, yeah, it's it's great uh, the uh, having a having a historical gardens and Ronnie's going to phone in next week and talk a little bit more about it. Give us a little bit of history uh, mm-hmm. from the gardens. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, you betcha. Fabulous. Um, now we have Linda joining us. Good morning, Linda. Good morning. Mm-hmm. I'm having trouble with my blueberries. Mm-hmm. They didn't produce any this year to speak of. And the leaves started turning crinkling up and, and going brown. Mm. Um, maybe it's the increased heat. Maybe they need more mm-hmm. water than usual. I'm, I'm left puzzled. Linda, uh, you, and you're you're locally here in the Okanagan? or? Uh, no, I'm uh, Victoria. Oh, you're area. in Victoria? Because blueberries should do very, very well down there. Here, we, we don't struggle with them, but they do need extra care, a little bit more monitoring of things because we have this alkaline soil and they need acid and whatnot. So these blueberries are how old? Been in the ground for a while. Yeah, I would say so. I've got some. I've, I've got some bushes that are about up to my uh, my hips. Okay, so they're the high bush blueberries, and uh, well, uh, there are weevil issues with blueberries, aren't there, Ken? Yeah, there's there's uh, quite a few different disorders, but uh, it's one of these things. Do you notice that they're getting crispy, like around the edges of the leaves at all, or is it more? Oh yeah, the, it, the the leaves are dying off. One of them, uh, one of the blueberry bushes I have, the leaves are almost all gone. And this is a blueberry bush though that isn't like the other ones. It's small. Yeah, yeah. It looks to me like they're all dying. I don't know what to think. Hmm. Yeah, well, drought is an issue, and you know it's something we've we've we're all suffering with this year in the gardens, but. Um, uh, that's something you may know if the plants have been drying out between the waterings or if you have been watering them or not so much. Do you, yeah, I tell? water them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so it's one of these things that they they really, really need to be consistently mm-hmm. moist. And, I, and it could be just with the added heat and drought that maybe that is one of the things. Because with the browning leaves, crispy edges, and, and leaves just totally defoliating, that is often the issue. Uh, but, uh, you know, usually what you need to do is you need to inspect them up close and sometimes with a, uh, let's say, or even a photograph would be helpful 
Uh, occasionally, but not not that often, there are sometimes there are issues with the root systems, and they will show up a certain way with the foliage and the way that they're browning out. But uh, it's one of these things. If if you just because it's something that you do need to sort of hold in your hand or have a picture of, you could either email us a, a photograph of of one of the plants that's declining. And then we could, you know, have a look at that and maybe email you back with some, some information or even further questions, things to check. Yep. Uh, or you could take a sample, which is what we usually encourage is to take a sample maybe about a, a foot long that sort of shows some green leaves with some browning mm-hmm. on it. And then take that to a local uh, garden center or to su- somebody who knows about about plants and uh, to have them have a look at it, because that's the ultimate, is when you can hold it in your hand. Ken, you remember years ago, when we had the nursery, um, you discovered quite a bit of weevil issues in our blueberry, potted blueberries. Yeah. Remember? You were digging down. Oh, yeah. you, it was one of the first times I'd ever seen weevils, and you showed it to me. Root weevils, yeah. So there's root weevil, possibly. Um, do you have, Linda, do you have any new shoots coming at all? Any new growths appearing? Not that I've noticed, no. No, Okay. Because uh, if if it was a, an event, like got dry, got hurt, hot, and that, now with fall coming on, you'd, su- you'd see some new start shoots starting to yeah. new growth. And if you're not seeing that, then there's something a little bit more involved. And I would definitely dig down around the, the base of the plant and see if there's anything chewing at the bark or chewing at the roots. Uh, and with weevils, they'll often, the adult will leave a notch yeah, uh, like in the on leaves, the side so. of the leaves. So mm-hmm. finding a leaf that's still green and, and might have little notches in the sides of them would be something to look for. Yep. No, didn't see any notches. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much. Yeah, it's a bit of a puzzle, but uh, like, like Ken said, you know, uh, some of these things uh, as horticulturists and people that are checking things out you almost need to have this in your hand and, and look but those are some of the things for you to look for linda and, and dig around the base and see if you see any chewing of the of the roots or the uh and and look and dig Stem. down beside and see if you can find some white roots activity because at this time of year you should see that happening some nice white root activity near the surface yeah, yeah spreading out okay okay yeah, we'll okay. have a look. And if you do see white roots, that means that there's there's positivity in the future. Yeah. So in the <laughs> spring, it should be smartening up again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thank okay. you, dear. Okay, bye. Appreciate the call. Bye-bye bye now. Yeah. yeah. You bet. Um, okay. Uh, this is uh, the time of year uh, that people are planting bulbs, uh, spring blooming bulbs. Some people call them spring bulbs because they bloom in the spring. Some people call them fall bulbs because you plant them in the fall. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is bulb season, and uh, the, the garden centers will have their stock in now, the tulips, daffodils, hyacinths, crocus, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, so you want to, uh, when you get your bulbs, you can plant them right away. Unless you need to create a space for them, you can plant them right away. The, the old, uh, you know, a lot of, over the years, people said, oh, no, you can't plant your bulbs too early because they'll start to grow and then freeze over the winter and blah, blah. No. If that was the case, then the bulbs that are still out there that have been there all summer, uh, they're planted. They're not going to grow. They mm-hmm. need the cool period to uh, trigger that blossom for spring. I have an announcement to make, Ken. Oh. I have some cyclamen neapolitanum coming up in my garden right now. Ooh. It's nice. interesting how that works. Um, in the spring, the foliage comes up, and it's got quite a little mass of foliage. Mm. And the foliage dies in the summer. And when it, that happened to me when I first had them, I thought, oh, no, I'm losing my cyclamen. Now it's just little blossoms coming up. Yeah. The blossoms are there, but there's no foliage. Yep. So it's, uh, it's quite fascinating. I don't know mm-hmm. if that's the way they work in Victoria, but here in Kelowna, that's what happens. Yeah, well, there's, there's several plants that do that, and I always think of those uh, the the colchicum, you yeah, know, colchicum. The, the fall crocus, mm-hmm. which uh, they do the same thing in the spring. They explode, and they have these beautiful big bunches of foliage, and they yeah. shoot up all over the place, and they're yeah. quite an aggressive plant. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, they just gradually just melt away and disappear in the summer. Yeah. But then in the fall, boom, they come up these beautiful big pink uh, double yeah. blooms, and they're lovely, they're fabulous, and, yeah. yeah. And they, yeah, they, there was something, they keep something out of the garden too. They have a bit of a skunky, oh, yeah, skunky smell to them. Rodents and yeah, yeah. pocket gophers and that sort right. of thing. Yeah. And then of course there's the 
true fall crocus, which is the crocus sativa. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's saffron crocus. Yep. And uh, mine are just starting to bud now. And do they, they produce foliage in the, at the same time, or do they do the foliage in the spring? They, the they're not quite like the colchicum. Uh, they, they come up in the spring with the foliage, beautiful mass of foliage, but the foliage seems to stay. It's oh. still there uh, now, uh, mm-hmm. dying back a little bit, but, but soon the blooms will be there. And boy, one a few years ago, I spent a lot of time collecting the little saffron out of there, the um, little anthers, aren't they? The, yeah, little on the anthers, and um, saved <laughs> saved it. Uh, you know, I had a kind of a tiny, tiny bit of it. Um, I remember years ago when my son was quite young, Joe mm-hmm. read something about you could make all this money on saffron; it was so expensive. As well, you need acres of it. Joe. You can't just grow mm. it, a few of them in the backyard. You need a bunch of them, a bunch of acres because it, it is expensive to buy. Uh, the it's sap. expensive to harvest. It's expensive <laughs> to harvest. Yeah, picky, picky, picky. Mm-hmm. Uh, almost like drying ra- uh, grapes or not grapes. Well, anything but uh, the r- cherries. Mm. I I I actually dreamt about cherries the other night uh, because I've been of course yeah I've been pitting so many cherries for the dryer. And uh, I I just dreamt about them. I remember there was a girl that I used to go with back in the 60s, and she was working at the packing house sorting cherries. Mm-hmm. And I would uh, pick her up after work, and, and, and we'd go on a date or something. Anyway, she used to say that that's all she dreamt about was cherries, so mm-hmm. seeing cherries rolling by. Now it's, <clears throat> for the most part, unless it's a smaller operation, uh, like Jealous Fruits is huge, and mm-hmm. it's all computerized. The it's computer lasers, takes yeah. The computer takes about... I forget what it is, 1,500 snaps of a cherry or something mm-hmm. as it goes by. It grades it It grades it for size, for, for condition, for whatever. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's all done with a computer. Mm-hmm. So it saves people from dreaming about cherries. Two five zero eight six two two five two five to get through to us today. And one eight 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 seven eight zero four two seven three if you're calling from out of town uh, in Victoria or anywhere online. Now, what I talked about before we took the break was uh, was um, CD annuals. We want to talk a little bit about CD annuals. CD weedy annuals? CD annual weeds. CD annual weeds. Right. And uh, uh, if, if, you know, now's the time. I mean, do not let them mature and go to, to yeah. seed. And pig. we were talking about crabgrass specifically because it yeah. just, it only comes from seeds. So That's if right. you let it seed, well, you got it next year. But. Yeah. You can use the pre-emergent seed to mm-hmm. prevent your, well, you can't, I don't think you can use it yourself in no. BC. No. You have to have a professional apply yeah. it, um, and and that has to be timed literally quite perfectly That's to it. get yeah, effect. in the yeah. spring. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, <clears throat> but in the old days, they um, basically did what I have on my sheet, and that is to dig out as much as you can. <clears throat> They're easily to dig out. I just take my knife and cut underneath the crown and pull them, the whole yeah, thing Yeah, the roots out. don't grow back. Yeah, and um, then and then remove all that adult stuff. Now you end up with bare ground, and that's perfect for, for more crabgrass to start in the spring. Mm-hmm. And, of course, it only happens, it only germinates in hot areas. It won't germinate where it's shaded. Mm-hmm. So in the old days, what they used to do was dig out the crabgrass as we we're suggesting and it's not a big deal to do that and get all that crabgrass out and um reseed uh, do a little top dressing and reseed those areas perfect time of the year to do that in the okanagan especially reseed the areas and then in the spring um let your lawn go a little long as you mm-hmm. go into late may and or into june let your lawn grow a little long in those areas mm-hmm. um and that prevents the seed from germinating because it can't germinate deep down like that in the shade of the lawn. Mm -hmm. you got to keep that program going for about two or three years, and you'll find you you will get on top of that crabgrass issue. If you don't have the time or the energy or whatever to do that, then, as Ken said, give your your lawn maintenance people a a shout and have them come by and, um, yeah, and then have them treat it with a pre-emergence in the spring. We're going to have to take a short break. We've got Bonnie waiting for us online, and we will be back with The Garden Show after this short break. Bonnie 
joining us. Uh, Bonnie, where are you calling from? Oh, I'm calling from Kelowna. Okay, I thought was my Bonnie lies over the ocean, but you're not. You're <laughs> right here in Kelowna. <laughs> oh, yeah. She's done that before many times. Uh, I bet you. <laughs> uh, I've been having fun experimenting on my deck with uh, lettuce and kale and that sort of thing this year. Mm-hmm. And the lettuce did really well, and the kale is still coming along nicely and parsley and that sort of thing. But I wonder if I could start lettuce now and... I don't know, start it outside or and then try and grow it under lights in the inside. You know... Uh, or, or hydroponically. Yeah, well, they the definitely, um, all those leafy crops are easy to grow inside. I think, though, what I would be doing is, is sort of starting them inside, uh, right under the lights and in that situation. And then they kind okay. of adapt, adapt immediately to the climate in, indoors, whatever you have going there with the grow lights. Uh, but outdoors, if you're doing anything on the patio, you'd want to sort of keep them going in that patio uh, situation. Uh, there is a possibility, though, that um, uh, that you could uh, potentially uh, trim the plants down very low. Say if you had a, a seedling tray full of small uh, lettuce plants, you could snip them down nice and low and kind of dry them out a little bit and then bring them indoors into that condition and see how they do. But I would probably go side-by-side comparisons with a flat that I had outside and a flat that I had inside that I'm bringing on right under the lights and see the difference. Um, Remember that when you grow any of these plants indoors, you have to have really good air circulation. So having a little fan that's blowing on them all the time is really useful. And just watching that water, of course, uh, which is why the hydroponics work so well for a lot of these leafy crops. They're constantly moist, you know, or... Pretty I haven't simple. tried any hydroponics. I'd like to get into it for the mm-hmm. winter especially. Mm-hmm. Have you tried any? Yeah. Well, I, I've i done hydroponics as early as uh, 1968 mm-hmm. uh, when we were uh, growing in our tomato crops in the greenhouse in bags because the soil got contaminated with some kind of a virus. So we couldn't grow in the soil anymore, so we started growing them in, in bags with sawdust. Mm-hmm. Now, that vir- virtually is hydroponics. It's soilless gardening. Yeah. Um, some hydroponics use no medium at all. They just grow them in uh, in tubes and, and that sort of thing. Um, and this year, uh, in the spring, I was at the um, Studio 9 uh, school, private school out in Rutland, and they had these towers mm-hmm. with vegetables. I was really surprised at how well they were doing. And um, I could, uh, if you give me a call or email me, um, uh and uh, Bonnie, and because I have the name of that outfit, mm-hmm. that you could buy that whole thing set up uh, for indoor use, and it's a hydroponic setup, and it has the lights and everything on it. It's quite a quite an interesting mm-hmm. thing. It's and not, they, it's, and it's called yeah. aeroponics. That one Aer- is it when, aer- the, when you don't when the roots are just hanging, and then the, they mist the roots with the mist. Yeah, system. yeah. It was it was very oh. successful. Yeah, it works really well, and for, for especially for lettuce and things like that. And to grow vertically too, it's it's a little bit like yes. when you're growing indoors. Then it's keeping every all that humidity and moisture within the tube, mm-hmm. and then it just drops back down into the recirculating tank at the bottom. So, like some some actual hydroponic systems are more like uh, keeping the water running and trickling at all times, and and uh, it can be quite a humidity issue indoors. You know, so especially like in our homes, but where these ones where they're kind of a vertical tower, uh, they're a little bit easier to deal with. There's not as much humidity given off. You know, there's always some, but it comes from the right. plants themselves, but it's not enough to, you know, cause your your whole house. Well, to... our homes are so dry anyway, I wouldn't mind a little extra humidity. Yeah, especially in the Okanagan here, we do suffer with dry air. Right. Mm-hmm. But I'd like to look at that place, Don. Are you, uh, Don, at... Garden expert? Yeah, uh, you can go Dawn at the Garden Expert or go D Burnett at the Garden Expert dot com and I'll send you pictures. D Burnett Garden Expert dot com. D Burnett at the Garden Expert. It's gotta oh, have the Yeah, I gotta have the in there, otherwise it goes to England. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, dear. I will okay, thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate that. Very welcome. Thanks for the call. Okay. 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 Thank bye-bye. you. Bye bye. You bet. Bye bye. And we have joining us uh, Wesley. Good morning, Wesley. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I have a question. Mm-hmm. I replanted some um, irises, rhizomes, mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. Now, I planted them very shallow. They're only down about an inch or two. And I'm wondering, do I have to do anything before winter? No, no, not with those. Uh, the The key with a, an iris rhizome is that the, the very top of it, so yeah. it should be exposed to the atmosphere. Okay. So, so the bottom part of it can be under the soil, and then just a little bit of the top of the of the rhizome is exposed to the atmosphere. And then you just okay. let the plant go, and they shouldn't be affected at all by cold or dehydration or anything. They're really quite durable, and uh, especially once they start rooting, you know, they're good to go. They're 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 right. very durable. So I don't need to mulch or anything. Just mm. leave them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just let Thank them you. Be. Here. I appreciate you, no. and I love the show. <laughs> Thank you, dear. Thank appreciate you that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for okay. participating. You betcha. Bye. Um, Bye-bye. Look at I just got a little text from Alan Reed, and I just want to mention that yep. the, uh, the, the, uh, the stand is open. The, the yep. Alan Reed's stand. I forget the name. <laughs> anyway, on Hazel Dell. Hazel Dell. Yeah, Orchard. why am I, my mind's going somewhere? Because I, I actually looked up the um, the hydroponic system. It's called the Tower Garden. Yeah. Uh, by Juice Plus uh, Tower Garden. You can Google that Tower Garden and and get that. Um, but it, it was yeah, there's really, a, there's lots really, of manufacturers yeah. of them, and it's yeah. good to check around and see what's available. They can be purchased off the internet yeah. or or. Uh, yeah, it's a, it, it was it was some creative uh, people reason, actually. Yeah, made the them. reason I like the thing is because it was so successful. And yeah. it, often these things are gimmicky and they're not successful. This this was producing lettuce. Yeah, and, and the, this, the whole key is in the light. Actually, the 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 growing facility is quite easy to manage, but you got to have the right type of light. And yeah. and the fun thing light. was this was January nineteenth. Yeah, January nineteenth. And it shows a big. So, um, yeah, if you're interested, I will send uh, anybody. I can send uh, these pictures of this uh, tower garden along uh, mm-hmm. if you uh, give me an email. And the Hazeldale Orchards uh, stand is open, and it's, it's On exciting. Burn Road, yeah. Yeah, and out picking, uh, he says, they're out picking the first crop ever in our new Bartlett pear block. Beautiful fruit. And we're going to go and get some Flemish Beauty because we got to get uh, the oh. drying, and we say they say that drying Flemish Beauty is the best. So okay. they've got their pears and and, uh, and apples, and the juice is going to be coming on. Oh pretty yeah, quick here. they're juicing. Lots of fun apples. there at Hazeldale Orchards on uh, Burns Road. So perfect. Okay, we're just getting close to the end of the show today, uh, and uh, I want to uh, mention. Uh, that uh, the upcoming event this weekend, or September 4th, uh, starting on Monday, um, the uh, at the uh, Abkhazi Gardens in in uh, Victoria, and uh, very exciting that uh, that uh, that they have what they have going on there. Um, yeah, it's um, something that they do every year, but it's the, it's the it's the paintings of the gardens. The people, these painters, these artists. Uh, all through the season, paint scenes in the gardens. And, uh, yeah, so we're going to have to say goodbye. It is right at the end of the show here now. We're going to start our garden tips, and then we're going to say goodbye. Uh, My garden tip, of course, is don't give up on your annuals. The fall coolness will bring them on. So just, you know, just don't give up on them. Mm -hmm. Uh, Hibiscus moschutus summer storm is my plant of the week. I'm having a lot of fun with that. People walk by and they just go, oh, man, what is that? Yeah, very showy. Yeah. All right, I also have a tip and a plant. My tip of the week is that now that we're into September, it's an excellent time to plant your cover crop. Any areas of your garden there where there's no plants growing, get something growing there. And a nice thing is a nitrogen-fixing plant like crimson clover can be planted right now. It'll germinate quickly and get up and start growing, and it can grow a bit next spring as well. And then you just snip it off at the ground level and leave the roots in the ground and go ahead and plant. It really helps improve the soil. All right, now my uh, my plant of the week is the Heptacodium myconioides for all you Latin speaking people, <laughs> <laughs> which is the uh, uh, seven suns tree, and it blooms in the month of September. It's just a small tree, only to about fifteen feet tall, and it's a lovely fall bloomer. It's just something unique. There you go. That's my tips and plants. Remember to check growercoach.com and Grower Coach on YouTube. A few years ago, uh, in Ken and I had the opportunity to go to the uh, ISA uh, conference in Victoria, mm-hmm. and uh, we got to sp- listen to Dr. Shigo, who is mm-hmm. the father of modern arboriculture. He uh, gave us a talk there, 
And he has a book called Tree Pithy Points, amongst many other books. This is one of his tree pithy points. Because the treetops are dormant, it doesn't mean the roots are dormant. Mm. Important. That's it. There's another garden show in the books, and we will uh, be back next week with more of the garden show.